Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world, you are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Naham Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 16 of the From Entrepreneur. And today I have an awesome entrepreneurial guest, Simcha Gluck. Very excited to have him on board. Uh, Simcha is an author. He created an innovative game. He's a coach. He has a show on Voice of Israel. I, I don't know if we're going to be able to fit this all in into one episode, uh, but you know, it's really going to be fantastic. I'm sure there's going to be a lot that we can learn from him. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic episode. Uh, just before we start, just a little shout out to Avi Zuber. He correctly answered a question in our last episode. And so we offered a shout out to the uh, winner, the first person to post it on uh, Twitter. So kudos Zuber, the Zubeast. Those of you who don't know him, he's an awesome guy. He just uh, got a job at Meerkat. And he's remaking Aliyah. Actually, he's a, he just went to maybe read up just for like a year or two, but he's coming back to Eretz Israel in August. So we welcome him home and uh, looking forward to hanging out with him again. Uh, but without further ado, Simcha, you there? Yeah, sure. Hey, Simcha, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Do you know Zuber? Uh, yeah, sure. Just from around the scene. Ah, so he's awesome. You guys got to get together when he, uh, when he comes in. Yeah, that you guys sounds will, good. Uh, really enjoy each other. That sounds really good. All right, Simcha, I mean, there's really a lot. I mean, there's so much we could cover, so much to talk about. I mean, you have a book out called The New Entrepreneurs. I want to hear about that. You have a, something called The Fresh Biz Game. I want to hear about the game. And, of course, Innovation Nation, uh, which is your own uh, radio show online uh, with, with the voice of Israel. I think that's exciting. And, you know, there's so much I want to learn about you. Why don't you give us just a brief overview about who you are, what you do, and then we'll revert back to some background about you, and then we'll go into more detail. Sure. And thanks so much again for having me on the oh, show. Pleasure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm 36 years old. I've really been an entrepreneur my entire life. And we could talk about more about what that means a little bit later. Very often we hear about entrepreneurs. What that means is it means starting businesses. And uh, with my company Fresh Biz and with my perception of it, it's um, I really like to focus on entrepreneurial thinking as a mindset, as a way of life, as a way of playing business and relationships in life. And um, I would just say is that I'm an entrepreneur that likes to help other people become entrepreneurial thinkers as well. And uh, that's very much part of what uh, the work that I do with my company, Fresh Biz. Uh, I, I guess just to sort of take a few steps back, if you will, my partner Ronen Gaffney is an amazing individual who lives in Binyamina in, in Israel. He went through about a five or six year process creating this board game, literally a board game <laughs> called Fresh Biz, just because he felt that there really are no board games or games out there that have proper entrepreneurial values inside them. And what I mean by that is we've all sort of been brought up in the same systems of life. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, modern Orthodox or yeshivish, or if you're conservative or reformed, you live in Israel or abroad, we've all pretty much been brought up in the same sort of educational systems where we've been brought up playing these games that reinforce competition, where money is the ultimate thing. In order to win, you have to kill other people, bankrupt other people, destroy their king, conquer the empire. I mean, all these types of things. And, and it's really, you know, sort of nice, but it's really bad chinuch. It's bad training for, for how we play family and business. Not you only know, that, if you but have, like, uh, you know, as from entrepreneurs, we, we always, you know, say that Torah has to come first. And a lot of these things, yes. I mean, if that's how business is played outside, you know, but we as, as the Jewish nation, we as, you know, as a from people, we need to show the right way to do business. So I'm excited about what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so Renan, you know, created this game that was just an amazing game about entrepreneurial thinking. It essentially focused on how to create what we call smartnerships, which are smart partnerships. Uh, in the new shared economy that we're living, you know, where collaboration is the new competition, what does that actually mean? Uh, what does innovation really mean? What does leadership mean? And this is stuff that we explore in the Fresh Biz game, and we guide people to be able to think smarter, faster, and better. We do it through sort of a, through a game simulation. So Ronan created this game. He gave it to his family and friends just to sort of play and see for entertainment value if they liked it. And they came back to him, and I thought that this was amazing when I heard this the first time. They came back to him saying, this is beyond entertainment. This has actually been life-changing and transformational. I started copying and pasting things that I did and I explored and learned in the game into my business. I'm getting real results from it. Wow. <laughs> and that was just a crazy thing for Ronan to hear. So he started developing an entire uh, series of game-based workshops. And how I met Ronan is somebody along the networking that I do, as we all do as entrepreneurial thinkers, we uh, like to meet people and collect the dots and then connect the dots and do all sorts of cool things. Mm -hmm. Someone had invited me to go to a workshop and I, I did. 
and it was a game-based workshop. I took my wife, Rachel, and it was uh, it was an incredible evening. It continued to work on my brain for a long time. Uh, it accelerated our real estate careers because back then we were both you know focused on building our real estate careers here in Israel. Now it's primarily my wife, and I knew that I wanted to uh, get involved with the team and uh, sort of get this message out there as a trainer, as an educator, as a coach. And uh, when Renan wanted to take the company global about four and a half years ago, so he brought me on board as co-founder. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. I mean, we've literally taken our game-based trainings to over 40,000 people across 20 different countries, mamash, like literally around the world. Our clients are, let's say, IBM, Pfizer, HP, uh, WeWork, Fatal Hotels. We got some big names. We have some local startups and entrepreneurs as well. And what was, you know, it was amazing. And this is sort of uh, something that's just to bring in, you know, God and everything God does because it's so, uh, the more focused we are on seeing him in our lives, the more we have our antennas up, the more we see it and the better our lives get. And it was amazing because very often we do things as life. I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and they wish that they could sort of get some feedback from the world around them. Are, are I doing the right thing? <laughs> Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Does this make sense? And I'll never forget, it was about two years ago that we woke up and uh, we got an email from Wiley's asking us to write a book. They said, you know, we've been following what you're doing. We love it. We want you to write a book. Wow. And, and for us living here in Israel, you know, I didn't really know who Wiley's was. I'm, you know, I said to Renan, <laughs> I'm like, are these guys based in Nigeria? You know, like, <laughs> what, what's, what's the, what's the deal? Is this First legit? First of all, it's amazing they reached out to you. That like, you don't really hear, that doesn't really happen that often. It was an amazing thing. And, and, and we weren't really sure. We said, you know, it's cool, but right now in terms of SEO, right now it was really hard to find FreshBiz online. I mean, you really had to dig around back then. This was like our old website. It wasn't our best foot forward. This is like early on in our startup, if you will. And, and we said, well, we're actually going to be coming to New York. Why don't you join us at one of our workshops? And they did. And within 24 hours, they said, this is exactly what we're talking about. They sent us the contract. We started to write a book. Within 30 days, it was licensed by Audible. Oh, and, wow. and that was just a fun story going down to Audible headquarters in Newark, New Jersey, and actually recording the book. I didn't Audible's really- in Newark. Yeah. And they have a great space there too. They really, I mean, it's a great, great, great space. It's wow. about three blocks away from IDT actually over there. Cool. And uh, that's just been really part of our journey. Sort of the new entrepreneurs is, uh, is us basically using um, a game-based prism for viewing business because we view life and business as games that we play. And the better we get at playing these games, the better we get at life. Obviously, Torah and Judaism is the ultimate game. Mitzvot, Averot, how to be connected to the source and how to live a life that is in the rhythm of what we're supposed to be doing in the world of social justice and kindness. That's the ultimate game that we're here as Jewish people to play. But right. then we specifically as people have micro games. And it's really about working with people to help them play a better and a smarter game in whatever they're doing. I don't care if it's running a nonprofit or a corporation, a for benefit company, uh, whatever. It doesn't really matter. All right, but, so I'm going to want to, I want to delve into that a bit. But before that, tell us about some Chagluck. Where were you born? Where were you raised? How'd you get to Israel? Where'd you go to school? That type of stuff. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was born in Newport News, Virginia. I lived there from age zero to three. My parents are both from New York, but when they got married, they went down there to, uh, my dad got a job actually down there. So that's where I I live from zero to three. And then from three to six in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, a place called White Oak. That was before Kent Mill got all cool and popular. (laughs) It's a nice place down there. And when we were six, my uh, parents wanted to Moved back up to be close to family. So I grew up really from age, let's say, six until I got married at about 22. I grew up in uh, Cedarhurst, Long Island, in the five towns. Okay. And yeah, so, uh, Where did you, you know, go to high school? I went to South Shore Yeshiva High School. I went to Hebrew Academy Long Beach for elementary school until right. about the end of sixth grade. And then I went to South Shore from seventh grade to 12th grade. And um, long story about how I got there, it just, you know, I didn't have the best school experience because there were definitely uh, some kids that weren't the nicest. And I had a little bit of a stutter back then. And I would get teased and bullied here and there. So it was sort of working to find my own path. And I think that that's a little bit how I sort of developed and became an entrepreneur was because I felt that I didn't fit in. And I felt that it was important to just sort of blaze my own trail, create my own path. You know, I, th- and, I think the majority of uh, entrepreneurs don't fit into uh, any type of real structure. Sure. Especially school. <laughs> sure. That's, I, mean, uh, I mean, in high school, I was making more money than the teachers, you know, with my candy lockers and side businesses. <laughs> Didn't go over too well with them. <laughs> Can I, I tell you something funny? Enough? I yeah. also had a candy locker. I sold donuts out of my lockers to everybody <laughs> when, when the canteen was closed. There Back when go. I was into basketball cards, I realized uh, that I was, if I, into, I was into baseball cards. Oh, so I was into baseball cards and it sort of transitioned into basketball cards also. It was like hoops and skybox and all that stuff. And, oh, baby. and uh, <laughs> when skybox came out. Yeah. Though, oh, man, those were such beautiful cards. And just so I can sort of take advantage of like having really amazing cards, I would just buy boxes and boxes. I'd 
open up the packs and I'd let people, uh, for like a dollar or two, they could choose three cards knowing that there were some very valuable cards in there. So it was a way of me sort of like completing my sets and stuff, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Dude, there's nothing like getting a new box of cards like at a show where we're just fresh off, you know, the, the line and then going home and just like locking your door and just going through the packs, opening them up slowly one by one, looking at, you know, <laughs> looking yeah, at sure. autograph and cards, looking for the uh, piece of uniform cards and stuff. Exactly. And it's, it's such a testament to the changing of the world. Back then I would keep, you know, I still have some cards in my parents' attic just because I thought it would just constantly be going up in value. Right. It's such a testament to the fact that when the world shifts, we have no idea. We can't plan two, three, four years ahead. But because of the internet, because of how accessible everyone and everything became, uh, cards have gone down in value, even though it could be 20 or 30 years later, because it's no longer like you have to drive out to, you know, Quogue, New York for some card show or right. who knows where. It's just, it's all, everything's available online nowadays. Right. But, but anyway, it's point. Se separate conversation. But yeah. that's sort of uh, the experience I grew up, you know, Halb, South Shore. I was, like you mentioned before, an entrepreneur. It's, it was very hard for rabbis to really get a sense on what I'm about. And it was a very important distinction that I only learned later on in life because I could imagine I definitely had a whole lot of trouble in school. I got suspended very often. I wasn't a bad kid, but I didn't really fit in. And uh, just to sort of share something that I found really insightful for me, when I was dating Rachel, my wife, and uh, we were about to get married, so she said to me, she said... She's from the Five Towns also? Rachel's from uh, Highland Park, New Jersey, actually. Oh, Highland Park, okay. And she said, uh, this might sound strange, but I have this cousin in Israel. His name is Rev Yitzchak Lifshitz. Uh, sorry, actually his father, Rev Chaim Lifshitz. He's a, he's a real tzaddik, and he's the world-renowned graphologist. And he said that anybody who I'm going to marry... I need to basically bring their handwriting to him so I can get the approval. I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Either, <laughs> either, either it winds up, he says no, and then it ends my entire relationship, okay? Or he says no, and we go along with it anyways, and then we have doubts in our head for the rest of our life. Right. Or, you know, what's the odd? It'll be a yes. But anyways, it wound up actually being a yes. And he said, you know, it's, it's 100%. Rachel was excited. I was excited. We got married. Baruch Hashem, we're together. We have some kids and family, and thank God. So you but, got married um, when you were still in the States? Yeah, sure. I'm in Israel now for nine years. Okay. But, um, you know, one of the things, he looked at my handwriting and he said to me, he said, uh, you are not a leader. Oh. And in that moment, I was just sort of blown away. I was thinking, you know, very much along the lines of zero, one, you know, one or the other. In my head, I'm like, well, what does it mean? I'm a follower? And then he says, you're not a follower. <laughs> it's like, okay. He said, you're the third category. You're the third category called the independence. And that was so healing for me to hear that there's these people out there called the independents, you know. Uh, Richard Florida calls them the new creative class, and uh, we call them the new entrepreneurs. And that's the whole concept is that there's a whole demographic out there of the new uh, independents that are just doing great stuff, and they're not waiting for stuff. That they don't need to be led. They don't need to follow. And back in my yeshiva days, rabbis didn't view me as an independent. They viewed me as a rebel. But I wasn't rebelling against anything. You know, it's like I, I love Judaism. I love my family. I wasn't angry. I wasn't upset. Right. I was just more of an independent. And I think that, that was a really good lesson that I learned as simply gluck a Jew, simply gluck in terms of my yeshiva relationship and definitely as an entrepreneurial thinker as well. Amazing. I want to I want to delve into that a little bit more, hear more uh, about that, about this third column, I guess, so to speak. Uh, but just to quickly sum up. So how did you end up getting to Israel nine years ago? So you were living, um, you were living in the five towns and then you said you fell I got married and we were living in Queens and Rachel and I both did something really interesting. <laughs> a lot of people think we're nuts and that's okay. But to, <laughs> to pay our way through Queens College, when I met Rachel, she was selling Cutco knives uh, with Vector Marketing. Oh, my she was actually did that for a while. Oh, very cool. So Rachel was one of the top sales reps in the company. Uh, I didn't believe that it was a real job, honestly. I went with her on one of her <laughs> they appointments. They have to be really great knives. That's they, the, uh, they are the fun best. Part. They really are. They are the best. And I went with Rachel while we were still dating on one of – you know, on one of her appointments where she was showing someone doing a presentation for Cutco. And I watched this person buy $1,000 of knives on the spot. And as we're walking out, um, I turned to Rachel and I said, how much money did you just make? And she goes, 50%. And I said, oh my God, lunch is on you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And you got to hook a brother up. So Rachel wound up basically uh, referring me and we pretty much both of us simultaneously sold uh, Cutco Knives to pay our way through Queens College. When we graduated, we were the only Shomer Shabbat office out of 500 offices. We opened up the New York City office for Cutco Knives. Oh and gosh. together we recruited literally thousands of students all over New York City that sold millions and millions of dollars of knives for That's Cutco. Phenomenal. See, nobody knew that. I don't know. Nobody knew that. I didn't know that about you. That's yeah. Great. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh my, my goodness. Gosh. The story is like it's just – it was a totally different reality. Maybe different my world. brother worked under you back in the day. When? How long did you go – 
Nice. We yeah. we were there, let's say from 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 2002 roughly to 2006. And um, what was really interesting is there was a manager, Joe Gianelli. He was one of the top managers in the company, and he had gone through this incredible self development experience called Landmark Education. Mm-hmm. And he said to Rachel and I, he said, if you guys want to make more money, you need to go do this this weekend seminar with Landmark Education. And back then, what's f- so funny is this is again this is 10 years ago. Our only barometer for success was how much money we're making, which is such a dysfunctional value nowadays. It's like really, meaning if you have a business that just makes money, like uh, like Ford says, then you have a really bad business because we're all about multidimensional experiences nowadays. But back then, we're like, okay, if we'll make more money, we'll go do whatever. So we went ahead and we did this landmark education thing, and we wound up basically doing this entire uh, year-long program with them. And we made more money. We, we actually broke our biggest year in sales ever, but we actually, we got our relationship out of it. We got peace out of it. You know, I really got a chance to, to be metake in a bunch of things in my life. And the most important thing was we realized if life is right here, right now, the American dream is a lot less appealing to us than the Jewish dream. And if we want to live the Jewish dream, what does that mean? What, does that, what will that take of us? And the answer was, it's going to take actually being embedded in the land of Israel. And literally within a year of doing this course, we essentially sold our business, sold our house, sold our cars, picked up and went to Israel. And thank God it's been a really incredible experience since. And it hasn't been easy all the time, but it's been a powerful growth and awesome life experience for us. And it's been a gift. What a beautiful, inspiring story. That's really great. That's awesome. Thanks. And you moved moved to Yerushalayim? We moved to Yerushalayim. That's where you are uh, today. That's where we are today. Yeah, we're in a community called Armon Hanatziv. We actually had a real hand in building up this community. And this is one of those things, you know, my uh, father-in-law says this joke. I think it's really cute. He says, when life gives you a dilemma, just make the lemonade. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the reality was we dilemma. got... Exactly. Was We got to Israel and I had this idea for a startup and I called it Israel Green Pages and it wound up failing miserably because of a lot of uh, bad hiring decisions. And I learned a whole lot of lessons. But while this was going on, we were looking to, uh, we sold our place in Queens. So we were looking to buy a place here. Mm-hmm. It's such a negative experience with a real estate agent, unfortunately, with just a bunch of things in general that uh, I was at this turning point and Rachel said, why don't you go into real estate? This novel idea of giving people like professional real estate service in Israel with integrity, you know, that's a pretty niche market, huh? Hmm. And uh, I said, sure. And, you know, when we actually bought our place, we were just one of a handful of Americans that were Anglos, let's say that, English speakers, that bought in Armona Natsiv. And for me, I just thought it was such an opportunity. This was right after 2008, the financial crisis. So we wound up just really marketing really hard. And over the past, I'd say six or seven years, we moved probably over 120 families to Armona Natsiv, really built a community here. Wow. Good Amazing. people here in the section of Yerushalayim. Thank God. That's beautiful. Um, so your wife is still doing real estate and... Yeah, Rachel's Rachel really is like number one Jerusalem real estate. She's just amazing. And uh, I left four years ago to, to go found Fresh Biz and to go write the book. And as of January, just because you asked the question before, uh, Voice of Israel, which is this great startup station in the startup nation. Um, <laughs> startup station in the startup nation. You got it. Voice JBP. of Israel asked me to run the show called Innovation Nation, where essentially I cover uh, some of the most inspiring influential uh, founders, CEOs, innovators, and entrepreneurs here in the land of Israel. And uh, that's just one more thing that I do that's, that's really cool. enjoyable. Who else do you, uh, who have you interviewed? I know uh, John Medved is somebody. Yeah, on sure. Show. John, John Medved, the uh, Dr. Noam Levenstrich from No Camels. That was really amazing hearing all, all the stuff that they do as well. I've had the founders of the car that basically it's a car that turns into a motorcycle, which is really amazing. Uh, I've had people that do 3D printing, or I'm just trying to think of something else that was, I just did a whole interview with the crew from ROI, which is funded by Lynn Schusterman, which basically brings inspiring Jewish leaders and entrepreneurs from all over the world to Israel for a summit and then puts them out into the community. Beautiful. But it's been really like just great people over here. I have an interview coming up with, uh, with uh, WeWork. Well, they're fantastic. Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. So Marcel Caspi. Yeah, Marcel Cassie, what's up? From uh, Pico, definitely covering a lot of the shared workspaces because I believe that the shared workspaces to entrepreneurs is like what the land of Israel is for the Jewish people. It's just the, the right environment for them to flourish. So I've been covering a lot of the people behind the shared workspaces to really get a deep dive into who they are, what they do, their mindset, and uh, which right, I find Sal the K most and, and Flack, I know that uh, you interviewed and we met up over there at the uh, launch of Subs in Beit Shemesh. Exactly. I'm so excited for you and Bay Chemish that you guys got a cool <laughs> shared workspace over there. It's about time. Yeah, it's really fantastic. I mean, they really did it right. It's like insane how good it is. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back. Let's uh, dive deep a little bit. And so we talked about, you said you're not a follower, you're not a leader, but you're independent. What does that mean? What is an independent and how do they go about uh, running their entrepreneurial life? 
Okay. That's a good question. So I'll tell you like this. One of the messages that we give through FreshBiz is the message of always look for opportunities as opposed to approval because there's so many opportunities out there. And uh, very often what's amazing, and this is sort of one of the things that, that our game and our training really comes to work with people on is what we call the abundance paradox. The abundance paradox is that we're living in a world nowadays where we have access to every single resource possible at our fingertips. Communication is free. We can reach anybody on LinkedIn, on Skype. Literally, it doesn't cost anything. We could reach around the world in no time. And yet on the flip side, the paradox is that there are still people that are stuck or frustrated or that feel like they're just basically surviving as opposed to really having this exceptional experience of the shefa of resources that we have available. And the reason why, like I mentioned before, is because we've all been brought up playing, in our mind, playing these games that really don't suit us, games that teach us that life is this ultimate fear-based game of competition. And what I think is important for independence is I think it's important to understand that we don't need to wait for anything. We just need to just really focus on who we are, our unique mission here on the planet. And it definitely takes time to discover or uncover but it's really up to us to go on that process and then to know that we have the best tools at our disposal. Because we talk about that the right tools and the right mindset and the right skills is really the, the ultimate solution for how to be successful at what you do. And just to give you like a sense of what this looks like uh, in our book, so we go through something that we call building smart businesses. We talk about the three uh, key components to what a smart business is. Mm -hmm. So number one is it, it's got to serve a higher mission. And it's got to serve a higher mission using your unique voice, for sure. And what does a higher mission mean, right? So there's a lot of people who just, they, they just do businesses just to make money, just to be profitable. And it's really uninspiring. Very often people will just look for what makes the most money, but they don't have any real connection to it. It doesn't really, it's not fitting for them. It's like when Groupon was successful, you had a bunch of people that were like, great, let's just copy and paste this. And they created Jupon and Poupon and Coupon and Lupon and Tupon. Okay. It's just like, hang on a second, you know? Uh, it might have been right, right for running, the Running after uh, every single new wave. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I get it. And there's opportunity there. But like the famous Simon Sinek talk, you know, which is like, let's get back to the place of why. Because at the why is where things are a lot more inspirational than at the what. And once we start to dig there, then that's really where things become inspiring. So one of the recommendations that we have, and, and, and we go into a lot more in the book itself, The New Entrepreneur is with a Z, by the way, but is we give people what we call the 25K question and the pre-exit strategy, which is, Nachum, if you have this amazing idea, okay, and, and you were talking about it and you want to potentially pursue it, then I would ask you one question. If I gave you $25,000 right now to never, ever, ever talk about or pursue that idea ever again, would you take the money? Hmm. Now, if the answer is yes, then it means that you have a great idea that you should never turn into a business because you're just doing it for the money. Right. Okay. But if you go, I would definitely not. I may be the wrong guy because I have about 15 ideas. So, you know, there's 10 <laughs> that I probably take the money for, but there sure. are definitely a few that uh, it's not worth uh, giving up the idea for 25 grand. Exactly. So meaning if it's if it's a whole bunch of ideas, it's one thing. But if it's something that you really want to base your plat, you know, your platform of life on as an entrepreneur and right. you say, there's no way I'm selling out for twenty five thousand bucks. So that's exactly. that's something that really does serve a higher mission. That's that's a great thing that you should pursue. What the a second, great, well, great tool, great the way to put uh, your idea in perspective. I like thanks. that. Thanks. So that's the pre exit strategy and the 25K question. The second thing after serving a higher mission is that it demonstrates what we call win to the wind power. And that's also some fresh biz language that we have around the game and our way of thinking. But as a people, uh, the idea of win-lose is so old-fashioned. I mean, that's just crazy. So we're already in a world where a lot of people are very excited about win-win. How could Simch win? How could Nachum win? I mean, that's that's great. Right. Win to the wind power thinking is exponential winning uh, that unlocks many different levels, many different dimensions. In other words, how could Simch win? How could Nachum win? How could the listeners of your radio show win? How could Israel win? How can uh, the authors win? How could people that do podcasts? How could we really set this up in a way that totally expands the value that we provide knowing it's possible? And um, in the training that we do, we help a lot of companies reformat their business model to allow more partners and more people to win as part of the experience. And winning can mean anything for anybody. I mean, obviously, what winning for you looks like is very different for me, from our listeners, from my wife. Some people have values of family. Some people have values of parnasa. Some people have values of impact. So it means different things for different people, but definitely is it's got to be win to the win's power. And I and, like that. I mean, it's basically the attitude of by helping others, you're not going to lose yourself and you're just going to, you know, cause everybody, when everybody works together to cause everybody to win, then everybody wins. That's what yes. you're saying. 
Yes. And it's got to be done in a way that's empowering for people, not like not one person that's like, you know what, I don't have patience for all of you. So I'm going to just win this for all of us. You know, mm-hmm. it's nice if somebody takes that leadership role, but it's knowing that we can all win together and creating this space where we all want to win together. And you look at the startup scenes around the world. I mean, that's literally what's happened. All these shared workspaces, all these ecosystems everywhere. It's beautiful. It's healthy. It's just it's so refreshing that people don't come from a place of fear. Like, well, I'm nervous to share my idea with somebody because then they're just going to steal it. On the right. contrary, startups share their ideas and through that they get great feedback they get great resources they get great connections right and uh that's very much the right thinking and the third thing is it's got to support your lifestyle and you know we talk about taking the lie out of lifestyle in the book and we get really into details about that because we've all been sold by people that don't have our uh best intentions in mind about what lifestyle should be quote unquote right but essentially lifestyle is just something where It's this ability to literally just feel centered and feel like every aspect of your life is nourished. So it means not just working really hard for a business to make some money, but then you get really burnt out and then you have health issues. That's not lifestyle. Lifestyle isn't just stuff. Lifestyle is a sense of being as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for us at Freshbiz, I'm just going to share this with you. And this was one of the things when they uh, brought us into uh, the e-summit in IIT Mumbai. This was like just India's number one university, second oldest. And we were uh, giving talks and workshops in, in India. We brought our whole team in. Wow. So we gave them, we had to give them a scaling up challenge. And very often a lot of companies deal with, you know, scaling up challenge and they tend to be similar concepts. But for us, it was how could we grow to be a $10 million a year company without being stuck in an office? Because that for us is part of our lifestyle. Really, we want to enjoy our family. We want to impact, but we want to be able to have a lean business. And uh, it, it's different for each person. But we definitely encourage people to look at how they want their lifestyle and then to do the stuff around that that supports their lifestyle, not squeeze lifestyle into whatever the heck is left over from people working their tuchuses off. And that's right. really very key. Gary Levitt uh, from Mad Mimi, I don't know if you've met him, but uh, yeah. he also he, like he grew a multi, multi-million dollar company without ever having a real office. I'll tell you something funny. He's actually on today's show. Oh, is he really? Yeah. And it was so, (laughs) I definitely will. It was so great. It was so great getting to meet him and get an interview him also. And he's such a tzaddik. You know, he looks like this, uh, this uh, Nachla Od hipster. He just came in on his bike, looks very, (laughs) very nondescript. And he's just a total chacham. He's brilliant. And he did everything the right way. And I love that. I love that he really decisively did things the right way in a specifically a lean startup mentality. He's got about 40 remotely employed people around the world. He's only met three or four of them. So he, we covered, you know, how he hires people the right way. And it's a great conversation about how to have global partners and have them be on the same page as you, even though you don't actually know them directly. <laughs> right. But it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Send me the link when it uh, goes live. I definitely want to sure. uh, listen to it. I'll sure. Post it in the uh, show notes. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So, well, I mean, you're, you're really giving a lot of fantastic content, a lot, a lot of things to think about. So tell me more about the book or more about the, um, you were talking about three things. You finished the third? Yeah. Uh, it serves your lifestyle. So one is it right, serves right, a higher mission. Two is it's win to the wind power. And three is it supports a lifestyle. Yeah. So, I guess. So meaning that you shouldn't let your business take over your life. Right. Meaning it. Make it, time for things that are important to you. Family, religion. Yes. Sure. Because for most people, you know, and most people that I meet and just even talking to you nothing with your 15 ideas, for example, I know what that's like. Um, <laughs> you know, I know exactly what that's like. We were at this place where we fresh because we were sort of changing our approach. We were doing a little, little bit of a pivot. And uh, we also literally just had our second baby about a month ago. Right. And uh, my wife said to me, she goes, why don't you take off for a couple of weeks and just focus on family a little bit and just sort of regarding all the different stuff you're doing with fresh biz, just sort of just put it on pause for a little bit. And in my head, I said, OK, sure. And I, I kind of did it. But <laughs> but in my head, nothing. there's thousands of ideas coming down every single time. I'm the guy that like if I go out, you know, and we have a couple of beers, I wake up the next day and I realize I bought three or four new websites. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I it, totally share the sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not easy to just go ahead and sort, sort of just not have it be an all encompassing thing. But what I would say is to really take some mindful moments, really, you know, hammer out what what are the things that are important and just focus on how to be able to do that. For me, family is a very key value. It took my wife and I uh, about 12 years to have our first baby. In the end, he came naturally. We had a pity on how Ben for him. Wow. But it's been, we really don't take this stuff for granted. So I really have such a deep love and appreciation for my wife and for my sons and for my family and for things like that, that it's really, it, it is a value. And I focus everything around that. You know, so I think mm-hmm. as you're talking about, like uh, times have changed and stuff. I think it used to be the mindset was that you would work hard for 30, 40 years, put everything else aside, and then you have enough money to retire and, you know, hand over something to your kids, hopefully. Right. But that mindset of working crazy hours or working for a boss or, you know, staying with the same company, even for, you know, your career, that has dramatically changed over the last 10 years. 
Definitely. I'd say that one of the best riddles that we love asking people is this, what is the opposite of working hard? Now, if you're old fashioned, you say laziness because that's how that's what we've been trained. But if you're nowadays, if you're part of our community in this new shared economy, the opposite of working hard is working smart. And uh, that's very key. Working smart allows us to really go ahead and to do things in a way that makes sense for us as opposed to what we quote unquote should or shouldn't do based on what worked 10 years ago or five years ago that now is irrelevant. It's funny, a friend of mine, Hilla Wasserman, used to say, work smarter, not harder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Very, very cool. So what's next for Fresh Biz? I mean, you have the game, you have this first book out, you're basically, you're doing coaching and training. What's the next level? Where do you want to, where do you want to take Fresh Biz? Well, I'll tell you like this. We would love to be able to impact as many organizations as possible and get them to a whole new place of how they think about their tough gear, about their mission and their vision, what they do. And we've done it in many countries. We do it here in Israel. It's phenomenal. At the end of August, I'm actually going to be going into the U.S. for about two months, uh, doing a whole bunch of trainings along the uh, East Coast. I hope to be hooking up with uh, Clark Wahlberg from InVision and a whole bunch of uh, these amazing people that are running uh, startups like that. Uh, I already have a bunch of dates that are set. I have a few more that I'm looking to fill to fill in my trip, basically. Uh, but that, that's on a personal note, just as I travel in the US. On a larger level, uh, right now for us, we're not looking to reinvent the wheel as fresh biz. So we're not looking to build a whole new training company. We are a lean training company, and we're looking now for global partners. And uh, thank God we had a great week last week where uh, these guys flew in from the UK to be able to meet with us. And uh, it looks really good, God willing, that we're going to do some stuff with a global training company that's got 32 countries, essentially, and we're going to be one more tool in their toolbox of consulting that they bring to companies. And um, for us, that's just a home run. Is to so basically, part- you're becoming a piece of the toolkit that's given over to companies and organizations. Exactly. So companies that are already essentially being trained by large companies in, you know, sales and leadership can now also be trained in on- entrepreneurial thinking, multidimensional thinking, collaborative winning strategies, win to the wind power training, you know, game based learning, gamification. So for us, that's very much a win is how can we partner and align ourselves with the right global training companies? to be able to maximize our impact and really be able to reach the most amount of people possible because that's what it is for us. So we design actually a, a fresh biz training kit so that if we're not in the picture, companies or organizations can essentially buy it and plug and play with their team members. Mm-hmm. So we did that to be able to scale up substantially and then also to scale up again, like I mentioned before, just looking for the right partnerships. So uh, that's pretty much where we're at right now. We continue to do it. Uh, we continue to do what we do, you know, uh, abroad in Israel. It's really, I mean, it's really inspirational running these trainings and getting the feedback that we get. I mean, it's really amazing. Like, uh, we took 20 people, 20 salespeople from the RCS sales team in B'nai B'rock through a process and their HR manager wrote, you know, 10 years of lectures could not have done what a three hour simulation did by getting these concepts into our people's DNA. It's wow. like, yes, yes, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. So. Uh, that's our mission is to just really uh, build this into organizations and schools so we can really train ourselves for running smart businesses in the new shared economy. And even if you have a nonprofit, if we run it in a smart way like a business, then it'll be a more successful nonprofit also. And th- I mean, this is all definitely a very exciting, very incredible stuff. If for What's the best way to get started? By reading the book? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll introduce it to all these concepts, and all these ideas and yeah, exactly. Our website is freshbizgame.com. Right. And Fresh Biz Game, you know, will tell you about our training kits. It'll tell you about our workshops that we run. And it'll also give you access to the book. And w- whether it's on Amazon or the Audible, it doesn't really matter. But uh, yeah, that's definitely a great first step is to just sort of get a sense of what we're actually talking about and what we actually mean. And then the exactly. game brings home those concepts. Just to bring it back a step, I really probably should have asked this earlier, but what does it mean about the game? What does it mean that life is a game or that business is a game, entrepreneurial is a game? What's the game concept? What's the uh, foundation of that? Sure. So the concept is very similar, is that when we look at what's called game mechanics, in any game, there's a concept of essentially uh, progress, right? You go from one point, the goal is to get to this other place over here. And then playing the game, there's different missions that you have along the way to ultimately achieve victory. Mm -hmm. And Business is the same exact way. Business is a really big game that we play where our goal is progress going from here and then winding up here. Okay. And we have obviously different goals. So for some people, it's to be the next billion dollar unicorn company here in Israel. That's great. For some people, they want to have, let's say, I'm going to make this up. You know, they'd like to have a program where they're impacting a hundred teachers of a local school. That's their game that they're playing. And what I mean by game is not that it's serious, uh, not that it's not serious or it's trivial, but it's got game mechanics. In other words, it's not real, quote unquote. It's not like your life is dependent on if, you know, if you get a hundred teachers or if you become a billion dollar company, awesome, you get to continue living your life. But if not, you pass away. It's not like that. 
Right. It's just, it's a game that we play. So the goal is progress. The goal is to achieve different missions. And the goal is to be as creative as possible as we go through from one side to the other to be able to achieve what victory is. So, you know, most of the games that we play in life were sort of already established and given to us to play. Like somebody, for example, and this is a mind blowing concept, but let's just talk about this for 30 seconds or less. Somebody made up the game of school. And it was a great game that people have been playing for hundreds of years. The idea that you're not really considered ready to deal with life until you go from first grade to 12th grade. And then if you're really committed to your life and to your success and having a good job, then you'll go to this thing called college, which we make up as four years. And we sit behind these ivory towers and we charge tens of thousands of dollars so we can give you a piece of paper that says that you're now ready to conduct life. And if you really, really, really want to dig in deeper, then we have this thing called graduate school. And it's, it's a big game that most people never ask themselves, do I really need to play that game? In this new shared economy where access trumps ownership, do I need a diploma or can I just have access to the information to be able to be a successful person? Can I have access to Coursera or Khan Academy or Udemy or TED Talks or YouTube? And through those learning experiences, be exactly who I need in life without waiting 12, 16, or 20 years of getting ready in this big game of education. Not so, only that, but putting yourself, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt with all your student loans. Exactly. And that's something that James Altucher, uh, spe- uh, do you know James? Ever, yeah. Well, yeah. He's, he's fantastic. He talks a lot about, you know, why are we going to college? Why are we spending uh, this money? Why are we putting ourselves in debt? And it's true. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of experience as the best teacher. Uh, that's something I tell people. But rather than sit and take a course for four years, you can take half the money, build a startup, hire a team, you know, go out and do and build and make and learn. And even if you fail, but if you're learning through the experience, that's going to be much more powerful and that's going to be, you know, a much stronger education than you get reading from reading uh, some textbooks. Definitely. And that's why for us, we use a game because a game is a simulation or an experience. It literally has people live the concepts. You're 100% right about that. It's just, you know, we're so, we're in this like sterile environment of the classroom as opposed to actually going out and learning through firsthand experience. So that's what we mean by life is a game or business is a game. And once you know that it's a game, it means that you could change the game. If you don't like where you work, if you could change the rules, you could change the team members. If you don't like where you're at, you're playing a bad game go move to a different game or go create your own one and invite players to join you. It, it, it's speaking this language. It's a lot easier for people to really get the concept than if you think that, man, I'm stuck at a job and I have to work here for the next eight years because if I go somewhere else, it means that I'm unstable. <laughs> and it, right? It's just like all these crazy concepts that we have in our head that aren't necessarily true, even though they might have been true 5, 10, 40 years ago, but it's become part of the vernacular that people speak. Wow. Now, this is really a uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, content, fantastic. It really gets your mind thinking and uh, tremendous amount to learn. And I suggest everybody to, to get the book. Of course, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. And Thanks. the game is available. Where can that be purchased? So one of the things that we decided is that we don't sell our game. We didn't want it to just be alongside people buying chess and Monopoly. So, oh, the, okay. so the only way to actually get our game is for companies or organizations to get our training kit. And that comes with uh, a bunch of games for a bunch of different players. And uh, for like between so it's 12, not, so even though it's players. actually a board game, it's not meant to be played. Just hey, guys, buy it at the store and you know play it. It's meant to be part of a larger picture. It's meant to be a part of a larger picture. Definitely, an organization can get it. They can keep playing it every single week, and they'll go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for sure. But we didn't want it just sort of thrown up on a shelf. And then our digital game, which God willing, uh, we're we're talking now to the serious games department of IBM to finish up our digital game to be able to make it available for organizations that want to continue playing with their entire team and be able to track all the results and all that big data and be able to work with it and create better teams and better talent management and things like that. We're now working on the digital game but exactly the game is not available for sale unless someone's actually buying something for their organization hmm, that's great okay you know this is uh really been fantastic just a couple more questions and you know we'll call it a day uh sure what would you say is uh what's the best advice you could give to an entrepreneur today what is the one thing that maybe entrepreneurs as creative as we are as you know as passionate as we are what are, what is something that you've come across that really we need to work on as entrepreneurs What I would say is a combination of personal development and what we call throwing the die. From a place of personal development, I mean, one of my mentors said, when you invest in your business, you make some money. But when you invest in yourself, you make a fortune. Who's this? And uh, his name is Mark Cassetta, actually. And I think it's important for people to really view themselves as uh, the ultimate stock to invest in. And I'd like to see entrepreneurs investing more in themselves, not just their businesses, in themselves. And what I mean by this is by putting themselves inside of awesome experiences. You mentioned this before, you know, it's really about experiences and experiential living. That's how it gets into the DNA of our body. Mm -hmm. And I think that if more teams went on experiences together, I think that if more families went on experiences together, I think if more entrepreneurs chose through experiences, whether it's 
it's a personal development experience or whether it's just going on a hike or just getting outdoors and getting some sun and getting some light, I think that we'd have better results. So that's what I would say, personal development and, and richer experiences. Beautiful. And uh, what would you say, uh, do you have any book recommendations, things that you've read that have been inspiring to you? So I have uh, two authors that I would go ahead and that I'd recommend. One is Price Pritchett. He's got a book called You Squared. And uh, Price Pritchett's very cool. He's been around for over 20 years. He's got all these very cool new ways of thinking about business. And it's very unique. He's got his own language too. Um, so You Squared is a really great book. There are these little booklets, so they're very easy to read. Mm -hmm. And the second one, um, his name is Shane Snow. And he's got a book called Smart Cuts. And uh, we basically met him at an influencers event in New York City by John Levy's house. And Smart Cuts is just a very, very cool book. Sort of a take on, obviously, smart thinking and shortcuts. And shortcuts yeah. might not always be right for somebody, but smart Smart cuts are always right for somebody. And uh, that's two authors that I would recommend reading. Wow, fantastic. Okay, Simcha, this has really been fantastic. Some really great information, really great stuff for us to think about. I myself, um, I'm definitely going to be following up. I'm, I'm going to read the book and you know, I'm excited about what you guys are doing. And uh, I want to wish you the continued uh, tzlacha and um, simcha, as they say. Amen. And, Amen. Uh, you know, thank you for sharing your time and for sharing uh, your experiences with us. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And I just want to say to the listeners, if there's any way that we can be of service to you, your organization, whatever you're doing, uh, Simcha, S-I-M-C-H-A, at freshbizgame.com. Uh, it's a pleasure. I mean, this is literally what I'm on this planet here to do. And it's nice, Nahum, we spoke about this before, uh, even before the interview, but it's nice being tapped into our mission here on this planet and to thank God being given the resources to just really just focus on our tough feet and do it and do it really well. So thank you, my friend. Beautiful, Simcha. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends. For show notes, archives of previous episodes, and more information to help you start and grow your business, please visit our website, www.fromentrepreneur.com. Listen, learn, be Masliak.